Hi, I'm Patricia Tallman, and I was part of the Star Trek stunt team for Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, and the film Generations with the Next Generation cast. And you are listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. While many stunt performers start out as actors, it's very rare for those people to do both, specifically at a high level. I'm not just talking here about being a background extra, having a few lines before doing a stunt or taking a fall. I mean being a recurring character in something with loads of dialogue, while still falling from high places or running through brick walls. It's even more rare for that stunt performer and actor combination to be a woman. And that brings us to today's guest, the magnificent Patricia Tallman. Whether she's doubling a member of the bridge crew like Gates McFadden or Nana Visitor, or taking a stunt on their behalf, or just acting as a different character altogether, Patricia Tallman is unmistakable on the screen. Her Trek resume includes time spent on TNG, DS9, and Voyager sets, as well as some time on the Generations film. Patricia has been a Starfleet officer, she's been a Romulan, a Theresian, a Klingon, and a whole bunch of other things from the Star Trek universe. Patricia has had a few lines throughout her time in the different series as well, but her biggest role would have to be the TNG episode Starship Mine as the character named Kiros, which is essentially the Star Trek episode equivalent of Die Hard, but in space. Beyond her time on Trek, Patricia has also appeared as a stunt performer or actress in TV shows and films like Jurassic Park, Castle, Austin Powers, Tales from the Dark Side, Creepshow 2, Army of Darkness, Night of the Living Dead, Speed, Monkey Shines, Generations, Without a Trace, and much, much more. If you're a serious 90s sci-fi fan, you may also recognize her as the telepath Lita Alexander from the sci on Babylon 5. Now, sadly for this interview, I'm not such a super 90s sci-fi fan after all, and uh, we're not going to really be discussing her work on Babylon 5 much because I still haven't watched it all. I know it's like a terrible sin to do this kind of a show without having watched Babylon 5 before, and normally I will do a ton of research beforehand for an episode, and in this case, I did, but I wasn't about to watch the entire Babylon 5 series before this interview because that's a lot to take in. So you're not going to hear a ton about B5 in this episode, but she has spoken in depth plenty of other places about that show, so I think in this time, so in this episode, you're going to hear a lot of stories and tales from other shows and movies she's worked on that you probably didn't know before. But hey, if you end up liking this interview a lot, maybe there will be a sequel with Patricia where we can chat all about Babylon 5 and some more Star Trek stories we didn't get to in this one. So get ready for a very in-depth and surprisingly candid interview with this veteran actress and stunt performer who has done it all named Patricia Tallman. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you about the different ways that you can support Trek Untold. If you're in a position to help us financially, we have a Patreon page at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support us for as little as $2 a month. Joining at higher levels allows you to have early access to the latest episodes, knowing in advance who our guests will be before anybody else finds out, or even the chance to submit questions to some of those future guests, and maybe your question might be heard on that episode. Shout out to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions, who create 3D printed toys and prop replicas inspired by Star Trek. Their items come in all shapes and all sizes and are always amazing, but you're going to hear a little bit more about them later on in the show. But most importantly, I need you to leave a review and rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to Trek Untold. Five-star ratings and positive reviews help this show pop up when new listeners search for Star Trek podcasts and make sure that they know they're listening to something that is worth their time. If you're watching this episode in video format on YouTube, please leave a thumbs up, share the video, and of course, comment there as well. Interacting on all these platforms is a guaranteed way to spread the word about Trek Untold. So if you've been a fan of this show, please do take action in whatever way you can and help make sure that Trek Untold can reach more listeners just like you who are going to love this type of content. And don't forget to follow us on our social media pages, which includes Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All you need to do is type in at Trek Untold on any of those platforms, search for us that way, and you will find us just like that. You can also watch the video version of this episode on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to at youtube.com slash nerdnews today. The video versions are released on Sundays, so the audio version will always come first, but if you prefer watching it, that's the way to do it. We also do a lot of other Trek-related content there, including toy and book reviews and plenty of other stuff, so you might want to take a look too, just so you can indulge and get yourself a new daily dose of Trek nerddom, however way you like to get it. Now, without further ado, let's bring in this week's guest and get this episode started. Computer, beam in this week's guest. 
And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining me on the opposite side of the screen, we have the amazing Patricia Tallman. Patricia, thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Matt. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been really, really great. I haven't actually wanted to talk to you for a long time. You're one of those folks on my list of folks who wanted to get for this podcast since like day one. And I'm happy wow. I finally got around to getting it, making it happen. Cool. Well, thank you. That's really sweet. I'm, I'm glad we made it happen, too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Patricia, let me ask you the first question I like to ask all my guests here. And that's, what is your earliest memory of Star Trek? I watched it. I watched the the original series with my dad when I was little. You know, back in the day, you had to watch what was on TV when it was on. You know, there's no recording. And uh, there were only like three channels. So you watched what, when dad came home, you were kind of watching what dad was watching. Right. So I, I grew up on, on shows like Bonanza and, uh, and Star Trek. He loved Star Trek. So I was really fascinated with Spock. I think he was my favorite character. Yeah. He was just so interesting and he was an alien and, you know, he was very, I loved his, uh, ability to not be emotional, to be very, um, objective and also hilarious without knowing it <laughs> interesting so. interesting choice but a good choice nonetheless yeah <laughs> so i'm glad you brought up that you watch it with your dad especially because that leads you mm -hmm. to my next question and that's uh patricia let's let's go real deep here where were you born who were your parents and what did little patricia want to be when she grew up um let's see so i was born in pontiac illinois which is um outside chicago by quite a ways we really lived in the suburbs of chicago but uh my mom decided to be with uh, my grandparents, my dad's parents, for uh, her delivery. So she, they, it was a sort of central Illinois, towards central Illinois. And my dad was um, an army sergeant, and then he became an entrepreneur, and he did various things, selling various things. He kind of moved around a lot when I was little. Um, and my mom was a homemaker. Um, they are both very, very creative people that that's where I got, get my creativity. And now as I get older, I feel like I'm even more like my dad as an entrepreneur and, uh, uh, believing in mindset and that you can make anything you want out of yourself. You know, it's up to you. So yeah, my parents were interesting. They were not linear traditional, although they kind of fell into that for a while with kids. Uh, but I don't think it was ever their ideal or what they wanted to be. And then I, my parents um, really wanted to enjoy life at a certain point. And my dad had a side business, which had to do with boats. And he and my mom took would take long cruises and on their own boat, you know, just to man it themselves and go away for a few weeks and have adventures. And I've always been like that too, like to go away and have my own adventures. <laughs> yeah. What did I want when I was little? I don't think I wanted anything in particular, anything more than any other kid. Um, uh, just to, uh, I was the oldest and I think I really resented having to take care of all the kids. It wasn't just my three siblings, but it was also all their friends, you know, so I ended up being like the neighborhood babysitter and taking care of everybody. And I got really good at that. And my mom got sick when I was young with breast cancer uh, and almost died. And then she rallied, but she, eventually she did succumb. And so we, we lost her young and then, uh, and my dad passed from, um, pancreatic cancer. So yeah, it was a, it was an interesting ride to say the least. So at what point did acting come into play for you? And, and I feel like you kind of put a little bit of a segue in there. Mm. Cause I'm wondering if, you know, the fact that you mentioned you're like the neighborhood babysitter that maybe, you know, Patricia mm. wanted uh, more attention to herself at a young age. <laughs> was acting like that for you? Well, I, I think acting was more, I don't know. Let's see. I like to remember when my cousin who my, my mom's sister had two girls and they, they were very close in age to me and my next youngest sister. So we would play together a lot. Uh, and, and Susie and I love to create scenarios and with our, we, with our, we had Barbie dolls and I had a fancy doll as so we would play, we would play Star Trek. And we would play dark shadows, you know, I mean, we would dress our dolls up and create entire 
episodes. It, it, I mean, it would go for hours. We would get so lost in these worlds. Uh, and because we had Barbie dolls, we didn't have a Ken. Our, our ship captain was a female, right? <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and the Klingon was always the older Barbie doll with some aluminum foil crunched under her head. <laughs> but we make their little teeny costumes and the, just like little strips. So they were super sexy little doll costumes for Star Trek. It was hilarious. Uh, so I think that uh, my, my love for acting really stems from my, this um, early childhood ability of losing myself in stories that I love, these, these insane adventure stories, whether it's in space or whether it's in a Victorian haunted house with vampires around. You know, it was these two worlds that, so I don't think it's any mistake that I ended up in science fiction and the horror genres as an actor, right? It's, it's really obvious <laughs> to me you when know, I could look back at it. And it's very cool too, just hearing how toys at that young age really kind of shaped your mind. And we've heard that from a few mm. other people too. I mean, speaking for myself, it's kind of the same thing, just playing with my mm -hmm. toys at a young age. It kind, of, it kind of shapes how you think creatively, how you approach things like things like acting, storytelling. Uh, so yeah. that, that's really cool to hear. Uh, now, did you do a lot of school plays as a kid? I did uh, in high school. Um, I did in high school. I was very much one of the nerds who did uh, one of the theater kids. Absolutely, you know all the um, the square pegs that didn't fit into any other place. You know the kids who didn't know they were gay yet, but were gay, and the the uh, super uber creative that got made fun of. And you know we were just we were all oddballs, but we uh, we were quite a tribe. I'm still friends with several of my friends from high school in the theater group. So once you graduated high school, uh, where did you go to pr continue perfecting your craft? Oh, I went to Carnegie Mellon in, in Pittsburgh. I liked their theater department. I liked what I had read about it and the, the uh, people that came out of it. I loved the training program. Uh, I didn't know if I'd get in because it's kind of a grueling auditioning process, but I did. And I was, um, I mean, it was, it was, you know, going to a fine arts uh, conservatory is intense. But it's a good place to really see if you got what it takes to do this thing. When I went to CMU, they didn't have much in the way of preparing you for the business of acting. They were really focused on the craft, learning the art, learning the skills, participating in the other departments so you understood how the whole machine worked. And now they have, their department has, a, they have a camera, you know, they have, they teach you on camera skills and, and on stage skills because they're different and they, they teach you the business, but we didn't have that. So um, it was kind of like being thrown to the wolves to, to actually go out and hit the, the mean streets of New York city, which is where I went first. Uh, I was in New York for 10 years and uh, I loved it. And it was also really hard. <laughs> I didn't really fit in any of the, you know, it, in New York, I think I did better as far as they didn't, their categories, their, you know, leading lady or supporting lady or character actor, all those lines blur a little bit in theater. Uh, and they didn't have New York City in those days, didn't, this was the 80s, the early 80s. They didn't have um, um, the quite the television opportunities that LA had or the movie opportunities. It was still really expensive to do that in New York. Uh, but they did have, they did had soap operas. New York was the center for soap operas and they did a lot of commercials in New York. Uh, and upon occasion, we would do series. In fact, Tom Savini's, um, Tom Savini cast me in Tales from the Dark Side and that was a series shot in, in the city. So um, things, I, I was able to get a few, um, opportunities once I did get to New York. It's so, though, I think now, now that I'm saying this to you, I got to New York, I ended up auditioning for Night Riders, which took me back to Pittsburgh. I worked with George Romero and that was my first time ever in front of a camera. And then after Night Riders, I went back to New York and worked some more before I ended up in LA. And Romero, yeah. Savini, those will be names that will pop up a lot throughout your career too, which yeah. is really exciting, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm gonna see Tom soon. We're doing a convention in September, uh, and I'll get to get to hang out with him, Tony Todd, Bill Butler. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> 
Oh, that kind of leads me into a perfect segue here, in fact, because I was going to ask okay. you about Night of the Living Dead, the remake that you did, uh, where you were Barbara, you are one of the principal characters here alongside Tony Todd, who is a Star Trek veteran, among so many other amazing things. What an amazing guy he is. Uh, really... and again, this is directed by Tom Savini. It's written by George A. Romero. These guys you've worked with repeatedly throughout your career. Um, but, you know, Night of the Living Dead, that's one of my favorite movies of all time. And I think the remake is also really good and, and very interesting in terms of, like, what Romero and Savini were doing. You know, it's it's a zombie film, but this isn't like a, a, a gore fest in any way. It's much more plot driven. Uh, it's a really, really, I think it's a really great movie. Um, just want to hear a little bit about your experiences on it. And uh, I guess let's start at the top here, working with Romero and Savini. I mean, just what are those two guys like behind the camera? What are they like in, in person? Uh, awesome, in a word. Um, George I'd met in, uh, in 1980 doing Night Riders. And uh, I I also met Stephen King, who came to be a, a cameo on, on the the show and they're both really big guys. They're tall and big and and dark, dark hair, dark eyes. You know, they're kind of these big guys and yet they're both so gentle at heart and they're like the grandpas of horror, you know, in their own way. It's just like, what? Where is that disconnect? You know, you're such a sweet person, but yet you have this terrible imagination that takes us into the dark. But yeah, so George, it was really great that I could work with George in 1980 on Night Riders to, uh, to segue myself from theater into uh, a, also a, a TV and film career. And then I did work with him, I think like five more times between 1980 and 1990. Um, but Tom cast me in Night Living Dead. He, he, uh, George is really good about that. When he's, he was producing, he wrote it, but he, he really handed the reins to Tom. And um, of course, as executive producer, George had an opinion about casting, but he was um, really good about, you know, letting Tom say Patty. So that was kind of cool. And Tom, being an actor himself, is a, is a fantastic director for actors. He's just really creative, really respectful. He really made us, I'll say us, but, it, you know, I should speak for myself. He really made me feel like he respected everything I was doing, loved my choices. Um, if, if he thought it could go in a, a different or more exciting way that I wasn't seeing, he was happy to, you know, share, get all excited with me, and then we would play with it. But we worked really fast and hard. We had 28 days to shoot that film. And uh, we, we did. We worked for six days and then had a rest. And then we'd work six more days and had a rest. And it was, we, I can't even say, you know, we stayed shooting nights. We, the first week was a uh, day in the, the cemetery and then we switched to nights and it was nights for the rest of the shoot. So even on our day off, we didn't have time to go back to a daytime uh, schedule, you know? So it was grueling, but really fun. I love, I love to recall play, uh, working with Tony and Tony is, you know, another big, dark and posing guy who is so sweet inside just such a nice man really wonderful actor would love to brainstorm about the scene and act and work on the scene together very generous actor uh, but I love to tease him because I don't know what was I don't know why I was such I was so mischievous with him so we would we had um, our, our dressing room area was actually the barn of this house, a falling down barn. And that they they made it as nice as they could for us, but that's where all the actors would go and change clothes and have a cup of coffee, you know, in between scenes and stuff. So and because we were shooting nights and it was really all of us all the time, we really had we really had like a house together. You know, it's like what we did in the shadows and this in this weird little barn and in between in between the stalls they hung shower curtains so there's a modicum of privacy to change clothes and the, in a couple of those stalls they put a cot so if you needed to lay down you could get away from everybody else not that there was not that you couldn't hear every single word being said of course you could but so tony would you know we'd all take turns to take a naps and i could not wait until i caught tony taken a nap and I could do something weird. Like I, the whole house that we shot in had these taxidermy animals. Those were real. That house really came with that shit in it. It was crazy. So I would steal one and then like tuck it under his arm while he was sleeping or made it kind of move until he woke up like, ah, what was this going on with that stuffed alligator in my face? You know, just anything I could do to be obnoxious. And he really was just so gracious about it all. <laughs> you know? 
See, if that happened to me on the set of a movie, that, especially a horror movie, I'd be freaking out the entire time. I'd be like, I'm quitting. I'm done with you this. You never I, knew when I was going to do shit, too. <laughs> I would really try to come up with moments of, of weirdness like that. Because, you know, we all got wackadoodle being up all night and shooting or the, the, the yard is full of people dressed like zombies. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh. God. I mean, having Crazy. done a lot of horror films, I mean, what do you do to keep yourself sane, I guess, for lack of a better word? What do, you, what do you do to basically not take it home with you and kind of lighten up after a day of, you know, maybe being covered in fake blood or doing some intense chase scene with a monster coming at you? What do you do to get yourself back to Earth? Well, I don't think I did. I don't think I did a good job of that. Now, now knowing what I know about personal development and, you know, mental health. <laughs> Uh, I, I certainly didn't take care of myself. I don't know. It wasn't a thing then, you know, they were talking eighties and nineties where a lot of this was done. A lot of my work was done. And so, uh, I, I really don't think I was talking to now a visitor about this. We, and she concurs. I mean, we all, we struggled with having a boundary between personal and work. We, I mean, who, who's got time. If you're working 18 hours a day, who's got time? <laughs> To, to separate yourself out from your work. You become your work. It's not healthy. Now we know, now we have this lexicon of, of, of um, concepts around mental health and personal development and taking care of yourself, mindset, taking time to breathe, meditation, eating healthy, all these things. We didn't know. We, I, I was drinking wine before I go to bed, you know, anything to just kind of numb out for a little bit and then try to go to sleep. So, yeah, I, I, it's a good question, Matt. And I think, I hope that actors today, I, and I'm, I'm sure they do have a much better concept around self-care um, and, and how, to, how to live up to excellence, putting, becoming excellent in every way. Like your whole focus is on taking care of yourself so you can be the best you can be. We didn't. We didn't have that kind of conversation back then. I, mean, I usually ask this question towards the end of the interview, but I'm going to throw it to you now. I mean, mm. what is something that you know today that you wish you knew back when you were first starting in the industry? Oh my God, so much, so much, so much, so much. I was very vulnerable and insecure and didn't understand the concept of self-worth. Uh, I didn't know who I was. And I, I wish... I could have taken care of myself. Part of what I love seeing about young people today, both men and women, is kind of this more of um, I'm standing in my truth and fuck you. If it upsets you, that's on you. You know, I'm bi or I'm bi. I have a, my gender isn't bi. You know, I don't have I'm not binary anymore. This is who I am. And people freak out about that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, who cares? Just it's good to know, isn't it? So everybody should have whoever they are. They should be able to be whoever they are. But I couldn't even be myself. I didn't even know how to be myself. I was constantly trying to make myself into somebody that the person across the desk would hire. Because actors have no power. I mean, Tom Cruise does. But for the most part, we really don't. So you only have agency over yourself. And you have to be willing to you know, what, uh, uh, know where your line is. I, I, I didn't have any line. I didn't have any boundaries. Nobody was talking like that. So, I mean, occasionally I, I would come up against something that was so outside my comfort zone, uh, you know, just so against who I was. I never slept with anybody for a job. I certainly had those offers. I certainly had been Me too We all have been Me too I mean, the Me Too movement that y'all see is a tip of the iceberg. And it's not just women that get Me too of course. It's the men, too. And it's, it's awful. And it's, it changes you. It changes. I mean, luck. I, I feel like I, in, in most ways, I'm really, really fortunate because I did escape with my integrity and I really don't know how I did that. I, uh, but I pretty much did. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you out there. But um, a lot of people didn't, and I never blame anybody for making any choice they thought they had to make at that time. They may regret it or they, they may say, but I don't know what I could have done differently in this situation. That was my choice. So I either get that job that turned out to be a career changer for me, or I could walk away with my integrity, but I wouldn't have a career. You know, that's the bloody line that's drawn for us. That's it. That's the only thing you know is in front of you. It's disgusting. So, 
Yeah, I I really have been very very fortunate to work with people like Tom and like George. You know that that, that was never a thing. We were, you were safe there. Yeah, well, I've spoken to other people before who have had you know similar issues, and basically some have had to do things they didn't want to do, and others have actually spoken out against these things, and then yeah. they got blacklisted. They had a hard sure. time finding work. So exactly, you know, it, it's sad that it's such a common story, but that's unfortunately what the situation was in the eighties and nineties. Yeah, and well, and I think it's gone on until just now. Yeah, <laughs> I think <yeah>. it's. <laughs> Really, honestly, and I just haven't been as active in in the business. Plus, okay, I, and I've talked about this before too. Um, and I don't want to cuss if your show is not a cussing show because I I cuss. You know, I, I'm a stunt woman, and we all cuss. Okay, so the, and this is absolutely true, and I probably won't be able to put this in a really good way, but the, you, you have to be fuckable as an actor. You got to be fuckable, and even if you're playing a character or or you know you're not the leading man or leading lady, you still need to be fuckable in that you need to be funny, talented. Um, you got to have some kind of sass or sex appeal or you're not going to get hired. And I know actresses who are in their 70s who still starve themselves thin, who still worry about being fuckable, because even then they have to have some sort of charm or sex appeal in order to work. Now, I know we're, we're looking at women like, uh, you know, our, our wonderful older character actresses who, especially in the, from the British side of things, they're, they can age a little more naturally and they still, and they work and that's fantastic. But I bet you couldn't name more than three or four. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, there's a small handful of those older ladies who work all the time. The rest of us, good luck. So I kind of got to a point where uh, for me, I, I just, I don't, I have nothing bad to say about plastic surgery or any of that stuff. You know, if that helps go for, you do what you got to do. You do you kind of thing, but I haven't been able to do it. And I always thought I would, but I'm such a chicken when it comes to surgery. I hate it so much. And the idea of going into the hospital for elective, you're going to put me under and put a knife in me, freaks me out so much that I haven't been able to go there, but I don't judge it. And I sort of backed off from all of that to be someone more, I don't know, I wanted to experience something else. I wanted, if I had been at Matt, if I had done any other thing and put the kind of energy, effort, discipline, uh, marketing skills, time and energy into that, that I put into my acting career, if I put that into anything else, I would be a billionaire. I'd be a billionaire. But I have no agency as an actor. I have no agency over my career except for you know the little wee bits I can control. And actors are charged and nickel and dimed for everything, every service you need, every um, you know your pictures, your resumes. You and there's a there's a product called the breakdowns, which you know I'm not sure like right now today how those work. But when I was busy in the industry, actors were not allowed. It was illegal to get the breakdowns. Now, what other career do you know that you're not allowed to get the job listings? Because that's what they are. There's what they're, what's casting. And actors are it, forbidden by law to get them. What kind of bullshit is that? That's the way the business is set up against actors. And I got to a point, you know, where I, I, I was so angry all the time that it just ate away at me. Well, I'm glad yeah. you did eventually find a way out and find something else that you want to do, find your <laughs> new passion, which we're going to talk yeah. about later on, too. Um, so I actually ask, uh, around what time did you arrive to Hollywood? Because you said you were working a lot in New York. Originally. Yeah. You were doing work in theater. When did you actually make the shift out to Hollywood full time? 88, 1988. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was like Roadhouse, one of your first gigs out there? It was my very first. It was. Okay. Cause I actually want to ask yeah. about that because I saw that in your credits and I was like, this is a terrible segue considering what we just talked about, but you're listed That's on IMDb right. as Bandstayed Babe. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it was like, a stunt job. So, stunt job, uh, okay. I, yeah, so I had gotten, um, I talk about this in my book a little bit, but I had gotten um, familiar with some stunt people while I was on the East Coast. And I parlayed that, pardon me, I parlayed that into some meetings when I came out here, first came out here to the West Coast. And a lovely lady named Sheree Ray, who was an amazing stunt woman, took me around and kind of, you know, introduced me to people, one of the people she introduced me to. Um, Let's see. It was Charlie Paterni, and and uh, I don't know if you know who Rowdy Harrington is. He's one of yeah George Romero's 
uh, group, you know, those wonderful brainy guys that are just very talented. Rowdy was directing. So I was able to, Rowdy okayed me for this, this small part that had a little bit of an acting edge to it because he knew that I was an actor first. And Charlie didn't know anything about me, of course. I'm brand new out here. And he's like, fine, you know, we're just going to, we're going to kick her over in a chair. She's just got to kind of fly back, ass over teacup. No big deal. So Rowdy, director, you want her? Great. No problem. So that was my first job. And uh, unfortunately, I had played softball with a bunch of my friends that had lived out here the night before and put, I got, ended up with a, uh, a spike through my knee. Um, yeah, it was, it was bad in the hospital, you know, like 40 stitches through my knee came out, they wanted to put me in a cast. And I said, I can't be in a cast. I'm working tomorrow. You can't put me in a cast. So they, they wrapped up my leg. Yeah. They wrapped up my leg and I hobbled on set. I was in so much pain. I was blind with pain and I was dreading talking to the stunt coordinator. He was like, Oh yeah. Okay. Well, no problem. And they, they just worked around it because they're so used to working around people with injuries. <laughs> yeah. So it was my first job and it, I, it was kind of a blur because I was in agony the entire day. <laughs> oh yeah it sounds like it i can't even imagine that uh now was, was charles paterni we talked about him a lot on the show actually uh was he the stunt coordinator in roadhouse or was that someone else he was he was okay so yeah yes yeah, so how'd you like work with him because he is a legend in the industry i like i said i was like ah you know i was this is my first work day in hollywood You're in good and hands I'm, with charles paterni. I'm all messed up but he was so gracious and he just you know he didn't even phase him that i had my knee all wrapped up and i couldn't bend my leg couldn't bend it and he said, it's all right. So here, we'll just do it like this. Keep your legs straight. You're, you know, keep, make your legs go like that. It'll be even funnier, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, okay. <laughs> A lot of petticoats, you know, flying over backwards, very eighties in the, in the, in the petticoat, you know, Madonna kind of skirt thing going on. And it was hilarious. So great, grateful for that. Yeah. You know, I think you're like one of the few performers out there who's done both acting on screen, having your face on screen, because that's the thing most stunt performers don't like to have done, while again also being a stunt performer. So, uh, you know, I find that really fascinating as well, because you don't really see that that often. Usually it's one or the other. You're either a, an actor or a stunt performer, because stunt performers, typically you don't want your face burned on screen, because that can affect jobs for future episodes, things like that. Exactly. Um, so, you know, what got you, you know, if this was your first stunt job here, what kind of got you on that path to keep going in stunts? Oh, I've, I've done stunts in, on the East Coast. Okay. Uh, I just what, what hadn't done them on the West Coast, you know, okay. so here. Uh, Let me backtrack uh, that for you a little bit, actually, and ask you then, like, who trained you for stunts? How did you even get into that field? Stunts are, stunts are an interesting job. I mean, there's really not a formal stunt school there. There have been stunt schools that have uh, popped up here and there. and But what I find is that you can train on for specific things here and there now. So martial arts are a great skill, for example, to have, or gymnast, being a gymnast, coming from that. I came as a dancer, so I was good at holding choreography in my mind. I was good with my body. I knew what to do with my body. And then what you do is you kind of apprentice. You know, you, you find a stunt coordinator who's doing the kind of shows you want to do. You offer to help drag equipment around for them or whatever. And then, and then they often have days of training where they'll bring some equipment in and they'll teach you how to use an air ram or a ratchet or they'll practice some high falls or things like that so that they they can bring up some new stunt people to work with them uh stunt coordinators are always looking for uh good reliable stunt people to have on set with them they, they want to know they can trust you they want to know that you're not going to balk or freeze or embarrass them because it costs a buttload of money i mean you're putting somebody in the driver's seat of a car you're going to crash how much money is that you know, not only the car, but the special effects and the time. I mean, a t the time on a movie could be $100,000 an hour. It could be insanely expensive. So they need to know that you're going to show up and you're going to be able to, to do your job, do what you say you're going to do. It's really great when you get a coordinator that that likes you, trusts you, wants to work with you. And I was a good size. I was five, I'm five nine. And in those days, I was nice and thin. So I could double a lot of actresses, you know, um, so I was a, a good uh, person for them to know. They were always looking for women who could take what they call a hard hit, um, who looked like me, you know, who was, was slender enough to double some of these anorexic actresses. And it's, that was a really particular niche to fill. So I was fortunate. 
Did I answer your question? I, I think so. And then you actually kind of okay. led into another one I wanted to ask. You're so good okay. at this. You're a pro. Seriously. Oh, uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to actually ask, you know, since you mentioned doubling, uh, I saw mm -hmm. that you were in The Stand, which is a uh, uh -huh. very topical thing from Stephen King. It's a sure. really topical thing to this day at this moment with the pandemic going on. Yikes. But uh, yeah, I was curious. Were you Molly Ringwald's double in that film? Who did you double I for? was. I was. I was Molly's double. Yeah. That was interesting. I was a little disappointed when I met Molly. I thought she was uh, rude. You know, that, that was heartbreaking because I loved her. I thought she was the bee's knees and I was really excited to meet her. That was a gnarly day. I use this, I use this, uh, this story as an example. Um, it's now I, I, I work at, uh, in coaching people, life coaching. I like to help people uh, live up to their own potential to make their life more magical and joyful. And one of the things I talk about is trusting your gut and that's a, this. I use this show as an example. So we our our stunt coordinator was named Dan, and I'm forever grateful to Dan for this. We we had a scene in the stand where the house that's the headquarters for the uh, good guys, basically Molly's team, right? Molly and Rob Lowe's team is going to get blown up. It's going to they have an explosion go off from the bad guys have planted a bomb. The, the set was a real house with a fake plate glass window and the special effects guys had attached explosives to it to blow it out. My character, um, Molly's character is seven months pregnant. So I'm far enough away from the action and she's not supposed to get injured or lose the baby or anything. So we have her further back uh, from, the, from the action and the scene. But there's a lot of stunt people right around, some of who are representing characters who are gonna die. So they're right in the line of fire. And the first time the stunt goes, that the window blows out, we all do what we're supposed to do. And Dan sends us back to, our, to the stunt person's tent. We had a big tent and said, um, I don't think the, the, the director's happy. So don't change your clothes. So we go, we're all, we just kick it. And about 45 minutes later, Dan comes back and says, right, they're resetting the scene. It's going to take about four hours. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. If you fuck up, you don't want it to be on you. It, it, this was a bad thing, a very bad thing for this coat, the special effects guys, right? But they had to reset this whole set. So Dan says, I've got a really bad feeling. I want you guys to double up on all the fire gel you're wearing. Pat, I want you to put on Nomex, which the Nomex is the uh, is the fireproof long johns, basically that like uh, race car drivers wear. So if there is a fire, it, it it's a layer of protection. It will not melt on the skin. It's it's going to protect you for a few more moments, not forever, but for a few more moments with if there's a fire. So he's telling me, and my character is supposed to be in the safety zone. He's telling me to put on Nomex, right? We're like, oh, and we all just felt it ring true. He had a gut feeling. He just said, I don't know why. So right before you go, because it dries quickly, everyone stands around this big barrel of gel and the fire, it's a fireproof gel. And it's also used a lot in special effects because it's slimy. It's, you know, it's the slimy goop that drips, but it, what it does is while it's wet, it provides a layer of protection against fire. So that plus your Nomex should keep you safe until someone could get an, um, a fire extinguisher on you and put you out. So <laughs> that's that's sobering, isn't it? <laughs> the thing about what? So I have, a, I have a wig that's Molly's little China chop hairdo, you know, and I've got the pregnant belly. I've got Nomex on under that. And then we stand around the barrel. And when Dan said, okay, the camera's ready, you guys, gel up and then we hustle to our places and go because the, we got to get going before that stuff dries up. We put it all over ourselves. I like shoved even extra stuff up into my wig. I don't know why. I also just felt the vibe. I could feel the vibe, trusting my gut. Sure enough, the explosion was massive. Everybody ended up in the hospital except for me. And I only didn't because I was far, far enough away from the action. But I found when that explosion went off, I, it, it's like your mind goes blank. And the next thing you know, I'm rolling on the lawn. I'm covered in fire. And I'm like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I'm putting it out, put myself out because 
that all the, the guys that are putting people out have run up to the house where people are really in trouble. So no one's looking at me. And I rolled into the front hedge of the yard and I set the hedge on fire. It caught from me. <laughs> Finally, you know, everything calms down. They've got people on stretchers. Uh, ambulances are coming in because we had one ambulance standing by, but now they need several. So ambulances are coming in and I'm helping. I'm just trying to help. I'm helping people get on gurneys and whatever we need to do. Uh, uh, finally, uh, um, I ended up going back over to our set, our set medic. And I'm like, okay, uh, anybody else need help? Where are we at? Is everybody, you know, have we got what we need to get? And he looks at, he's just looking at me. And he said, Pat, sit down. So I sat down and he takes, he peels off my wig, which had melted into like a, a, like an Afro, like this, it had just melted into a shell, like a Romulan hairdo, pulls it off of me and, and just checking me. So I'm just like, what's going on? And then he looks at my arm and I said, yeah, I can't, I can't get this tar off my arm. And he said, sit down, cleans up my arm, takes a pair of forceps and peels the black skin. It was my skin off. He put all this antiseptic gel on me, wrapped me up, said, I want you to go to the hospital. You're going to need to get this looked at. I said, I think you did a good enough job. I didn't go to the hospital. I didn't want to deal with that. Well, I, I like hate hospitals. So <laughs> when he wrapped up my arm, he did a great job. Uh, I still have, it, it tans funny. This part of my arm doesn't really tan, you know? Um, but I got off so light and it's all because Dan listened to his gut. I can't even imagine if he had shut that off. It's interesting because if you're an athlete and stunt people are professional athletes, I mean, they get paid to do amazing things with their bodies. Absolutely. And, and we are taught to overcome pain, to overcome fear, not to listen to your body. If, if your body is hurt, you just wrap it up and you push through, right? You push through the pain. Whoa, I, I, ha I, I have done so much damage to myself by not listening to my body. My body is screaming at me, stop it, stop doing this. And I just thought I needed to, to ignore it and push through it because I had a goal. And now I know how detrimental that is. And now the new wave of athleticism is different. People are listening to their bodies. They're working with their bodies. They're biohacking, you know, by, by super nutritions and things like that. There's just a new way of taking care of inflammation and understanding if your body's screaming at you, we need to take a look at that. We didn't know that then. That sounds pretty scary. I can understand now why you're also not so keen on Molly Ringwell just based on that fact, not even knowing the rest of the situation, just based she, on that alone. She, That's horrible. All the other actors came out. They were trying to help what's going on. Oh, my God, somebody's hurt. She never even came out. Uh, never even bothered. Bad. She was rude. Yeah, it's too bad. Well, at the very least, Patricia, tell me that this is the worst thing that happened to you on the set doing a stunt. Is this the worst thing? No, I've, I've done worse. Oh, there's worse? How is there worse? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, you do get hurt. You know, I mean, that's the thing. Back, I keep saying back in the day, I sound like fucking grandma, doesn't, don't I? It's, it's just grandma. so, yeah, well, we, I would, yeah, zombie killer, the grandma zombie killer of the dead. We had to do everything. There wasn't those kind of special effects that, you know, CGI and all that crap didn't exist. So we really had to do the explosions and we had to be flung off of buildings and, and do these, you know, 200 story high falls. And, you know, we really had to do it. So you know, take the car off a cliff. There are people in that car. You know, It's like, it's crazy what we did. So now, luckily, you know, we don't have to put a population um, at risk in the same way. But yeah, I, do, I pay a toll. I think, you know, right now, like today, uh, my energy is very low because I'm struggling with some pain, chronic pain that I have. And there's not a whole lot I can do about it right now. I, I mean, it is what it is. I try to rest. I try to, you know, take care of myself in the ways we know we can do. But it's, it's not easy being an old athlete. <laughs> it's definitely not easy. Uh, yeah, I broke my back. Um, I've broken my arm, foot, fingers, toes. I've been really lucky. Oh, I broke my ribs. I've been really lucky, though. It could have been so much worse. So, and I just didn't care in those days. 
like I said, my, my uh, self-worth, and it was pretty much non-existent. So I, I was willing to do just about anything. They say, okay, we're going to do that. I'd be like, all right. The only time I would, I would uh, challenge that is if I knew I couldn't do it. Like if it's a motorcycle stunt, I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. I'm not going to do it. I'll say, call Debbie Evans. She's, br- she's brilliant on a bike. That's you know? one of the things we've heard a lot from people who are stunt coordinators. They tell us, you know, they're looking for folks who can do things, but they also want to know if you can't do something, tell them or else you could get hurt. And that's an even bigger problem. It's a big problem. And I don't want to get hurt. Exactly. You know, I don't want to be knocked out of not being able to work. I, when I work, I make money. If I don't work, I'm on disability. I'm getting like three, 400 bucks a month. Who can live? Who can live on that? Stupid. At least back in my, you know, back in the day. <laughs> And now it might be a little better, but it's, it's not good. So yeah. Uh, and I think you earn trust that way. The coordinators who work with me knew I would say, yeah, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And they might say, oh, I could train you. Okay. Or, um, if like in the case of the motorcycle, yeah, mm-mm, not going to do it. The importance of saying no. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So something else that you did that is really exciting, and I love hearing stories about working with this person. Uh, you were in Jurassic Park. You were Laura Dern's double. Uh, I love hearing stories about Spielberg. Uh, he's one of my favorite directors. Uh, so I'd love to hear what it's like working yeah. with him. Uh, was he actually directing your scenes as a stunt person? Mm-hmm. Oh, my okay, God. Wow. I'm so lucky. I know, right? Uh, yeah, I was directed by Steven Spielberg, and he called me by name and all that stuff. It's pretty neat. Laura, amazing. Loved her. Loved her so much. She's just like, exactly what you'd hope she'd be gracious down to earth talented funny you know you get completely normal person wow <laughs> and i i I'm, I'm i'm proud of the work i did for her you know as her i did a good job considering i, I was really terrified of those um the the scaffolding the last scene in the rotunda i mean we, we start I, i'll just start with this one because it's it was my least favorite part was in the very end of the the movie and when the raptors are chasing our heroes down this scaffolding and uh, they end up on the bones of the brontosaurus, the brontosaurus breaks apart. I'm spinning around on some bones and then the bones crash and hit the ground. And um, I loved working with Spielberg, uh, but this was nerve wracking on this day because we had done a rehearsal uh, of this action because it was complicated. we didn't have to deal with the actual raptors. They put them in later. <laughs> That's the thing I keep saying. We None of us knew we were making, you know, quote unquote, Jurassic Park. We didn't know what these dinosaurs were going to look like. We had little toy dinosaurs that Gary Himes, our stunt coordinator, was saying, here's the action and the raptors are coming. Grr, arr, you know, like that. <laughs> this is going to happen and you guys take off here. And, All right. We had no idea. But coming down the scaffolding, it was rigged to, to, to do this wiggle waggle. And I, I hate heights, hate them. Even though we were only like 20, 25 feet off the ground or whatever, it's still, I mean, I get queasy on an escalator, you know, just like, oh, fuck, this is gnarly. And I've got to negotiate climbing down this thing. And then we had to climb out on the bones of the brontosaurus. And of course, Laura has to go the farthest. So I have to negotiate the, and the bones are held with wires to the ceiling, right? Like you see in the museum, wires are attached to the ceiling, holding up the various uh, fossil remains of these animals. So I had to somehow, and what they did was they at least shaved down, they gave me some footpaths. Uh, they shaved down the back of the Bronto. So it wasn't so spiky with vertebra. And I could, and I had to kind of awkwardly get around the wires by holding the wire to my back and scooting around it. And I, you know, just my knees were shaking. I was so scared, but we rehearsed it all uh, and had to rehearse with the effects teams. Like how do these wires break apart? Where do the bones going to actually fall? Where does everybody go? And where does everybody end up? So we can place the cameras tomorrow and everybody be safe. I ended up getting so badly bruised in the rehearsal and I wore pads and I had on a long sleeve shirt and I had on sweatpants in the rehearsal day when I'm doubling Laura because she's the babe she's wearing shorts and she's got a tank top on and then she has a little shirt she's got kind of belly tied and so there's no place to put any fucking pads you know and and the parts that need the pads are not covered anyway. I couldn't wear pads. Um, so I, now I, I get home and I'm, try, I'm putting on poultices. I have massive hematomas on my 
thighs, the inside of my thighs, the effects guys, when I showed up the next day, I went in early and said, Oh my God, I don't know what you're going to do. You got to cover these bruises. And the effects guys took pictures of my bruises as ref of, for reference for, you know, for, for like future reference to, to, we need to make a hematoma. Let's, let's look at those pictures of Pat. These, my, I was swollen and hot to the touch with these nasty bruises. Um, so they, they had to use, a, um, they used this particular kind of corpse paint. That's I was trying to think of the word. It was a corpse paint. So it doesn't melt or change shape or anything. And then they spray painted me over top of that to cover the bruises. But I, so I'm already, I'm already not a hundred percent and I'm standing with talking to Gary Himes. And, he, and I said, I've, he's telling me about something. I'm not sure what, and he's looking at the, the paint job on my legs going, I think we're going to be okay. And Spielberg walks up and I'm like, oh shit, I hope he doesn't, you know, it's, tell me I can't do it. Um, and he starts talking to, he says to Gary, Gary, I've had this great idea. Have you seen Home Alone? You know, that scene where um, uh, Macaulay Culkin knocks the bad guys, Daniel Stern and and Joe Pesci knocks them down and they fall through buildings like two stories and they hit the, can we do that with Pat? <laughs> and Gary was so, he, by this time, you know, in the movie, he's like twitching. <laughs> he's trying to, yes, yes, of course we can. We could do that. We will kill her, but we can do it. We can, <laughs> and he, he was like, oh, oh no, I don't want to hurt her, you know, <laughs> We have no time to plan something like this. He wanted to see Laura really take, follow her falling off the bones onto the marble floor. And we did have um, like a, an inch and a half neoprene mar marble painted floor to give us something a little softer to end up on. But we were only dropping from, I think I was dropping from like four feet by the time, you know, I'm not dropping from 25 feet, which would have killed me. <laughs> I love that though. Anyway, the, my favorite piece of working with Spielberg was when we were doing the Jeep scene and the T-Rex bursts out of the jungle and is chasing, you know, uh, Jeff Goldblum is all mangled and all bloody. And the T-Rex comes out of the forest. It's at night and chases the Jeep. The Jeep goes crashing through a branch and then the T-Rex kind of catches up. It's that famous, you know, objects in this mirror may be closer than they appear. Kind of thing. <laughs> they get that shot. It's the T-Rex catches up with the Jeep and hits it with the side of its head, hitting right where Laura's legs are. So we get to do this really cool scene and the stunt is super, I, I mean, the way they, these riggers fix, figured it out is amazing. We have this door is going to implode when, and I'm firing that. So the door fires when the T-Rex hits and I react so it, it, they've got a rig on it that sucks the door in to make it look like it's been hit from the outside. And at the same time, there is a, an explosive device in the middle of the Jeep with a piece of a telephone pole, like a four foot piece of, the te of a telephone pole that you can't see, it's, dis it's disguised in the Jeep. But when the T-Rex, T-Rex quote unquote, the, the, the invisible T-Rex hits the Jeep, they, they trigger it, the explosion goes off, shooting this telephone pole down into the, down into the ground, into the road, and it rocks the Jeep up onto the two side, the two left wheels, right? So it looks like the T-Rex is almost knocking over the Jeep. So we're hoping, okay, we're hoping we don't actually get knocked over. That would be a bad thing. But I so have so much trust in these guys. They're, the, they're so amazing, the, the effects guys. And the, the first piece is, you know, the Jeep, we, we are, are watching the T-Rex and all of a sudden we see that there, we're about to crash through this branch, which is going to take off our windshield. So we all have to duck at the right moment. <laughs> and our stunt coordinator goes, so um, what should be the cue for, for you to, to turn around and see? I said, how about duck? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, he didn't think that was funny. Was, that was an awkward moment. But um, T-Rex, so for us, and this is where Spielberg and I start to have a conversation. He says, Pat, you see this guy? And there's, there's this guy standing there with a big long stick. The stick is, I don't know, uh, 20 feet tall, let's say. And at the stick is metered off um, each foot, black, white, black, white, black, white, all the way up the stick. It's like a, a two by two stick. At the top of the stick is nailed a, um, a big, you know, like a pizza sized 
cardboard disc, white cardboard disc. And it has a happy face with teeth written in Sharpie on it. This is our T-Rex. This is all we ever know what the T-Rex looks like. And he says, okay, Pat, this eye line is one, your one mark. And it's just the, the stick. Now, uh, standing up straight. Now, this is your number two. And the, the stick man <laughs> holds the stick at the right. And he said, that's your number two. So I know where number two is. So number one's at this angle. Number two is going to be at this angle. And then he said, when I say three is when the T-Rex is hitting the Jeep. Cool. So what's happening now that they've done this stick man walks away. Now the T-Rex is back to being invisible. And we take off our Jeep and the camera truck. The camera's on the back of the truck. Spielberg's next to the camera. And they're all harnessed in to be safe. And we really are on a dirt road. So it's a little, they've, they've made it as smooth as possible, obviously. And the camera's on a gimbal. So we're, we take off and Spielberg goes, okay, Pat, one. And then I do my mark. And he said, two. And I do two. And he says, three. And I fire the door. And the thing happens. And it went, all went off. Great. First time. We didn't have to reset and do it again. But I got directed by Steven Spielberg. I mean, how cool is that? Even though I was wearing Laura's hair and I'm dressed as her, no one ever knows what I look like, but it doesn't matter. It's still cool. And so you were part of a pretty breakthrough thing in special effects also, because that was really one of the first times that type of special effect was done, where you basically had to work on line of sight where something is. And that's a pretty amazing thing also to be uh, adding to your list of accomplishments. Exactly right. We were so lucky. We had no bloody idea. You know, we went to the movies. All of us were like, <laughs> you know, just like what Laura Dern and Sam Neill do when they when they see the dinosaurs, we did that. We were our, we were just aghast. Couldn't believe it. It was incredible. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. Ranging from prop replicas to use in a fan film or cosplay, to accessories or playsets for figures in all different sizes, Triple Fiction Productions has got you covered. Past pieces for toys have included large centerpieces, like 10 forward from the Enterprise D, shuttlecrafts complete with working lights, and the Voyager Bridge, with smaller pieces including Borg alcoves, the Genesis device, and the dreaded arch enemy of Worf, barrels. All highly detailed products are 3D printed and hand painted in the USA, with new items added all the time, while simultaneously improving their printing quality based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit triple-fictionproductions.net or visit them on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Want to get 10% off your next purchase? Use code UNTOLD10 at checkout to receive this discount not applicable during sales or clearance events. That's code UNTOLD10 to get 10% off action figure dioramas, accessories, and prop replicas. Triple Fiction Productions, taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hi, I'm Jonathan Frakes. If you're of a certain age, you may remember me as Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. And my wonderful brother Daniel died with pancreatic cancer 24 years ago. They opened him up, they diagnosed, they said, you've got six months to live. And that was it. He died four months later. And at that time, there was a 3% survival rate. Since then, we've grown to the embarrassingly high number of 10%. But a dear friend of mine and probably all of yours, Kitty Swink, is one of those 10%. She has survived pancreatic cancer for 17 going on 18 years. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States with a five-year survival rate. That's just 10%. And more than 60,000 Americans are estimated to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2021. More than 48,000 will die from the disease because symptoms are often vague and be hard to detect. That's why I'm supporting the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, the leading patient advocacy organization committed to fighting the world's toughest cancer. PanCan is working hard to create outcomes for this devastating disease through its groundbreaking research 
in early detection and better treatment options. PANCAN drives progress by funding life-saving research, providing personalized patient services, and creating a community of supporters and volunteers like you who will stop at nothing to create a world in which all pancreatic cancer patients will thrive. You can help support our important mission by donating today at pancan.org. Thanks for your time. We now return to Trek Untold. All right, so our eagle-eyed viewers who are watching this on YouTube will now notice that Patricia and I have done a little <laughs> bit of a wardrobe change. Uh, this is a part two, if you will. This is a sequel. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, we just talked about a ton of stuff, not Star Trek. We're going to spend the rest of this now diving into your very, very long Star Trek time. So, uh, Oh, just, cool. Yeah, let's just jump right <laughs> on in. I'd like to find out how you got the gig for Star Trek. Was this uh, through Dennis Madalone? It sure was. Uh, I got introduced to Dennis when I was new to town, and um, he invites, uh, this is typical for uh, stunt folks to kind of get to know a, a new coordinator. They invite you to come work out with them. And what that means, it's not like we're pumping iron. It means that you're, you're going to go and maybe work on a fight scene, or you're going to go learn a new apparatus. Uh, they might want to see, like I, I got hired for a high fall one time. So they brought me in to show me how they wanted me to do it. And so we practiced it, things like that. Or I was trained on an air ram or a ratchet or and they get a chance to kind of get to know you. And then it, it often happens that you're a good double for a particular actor or and they, and they will take a chance on you if they don't know you because you're a very good double for this actor. So um, then they will give you the job, you do the job. And if, if they're happy with how it worked out, then they will hopefully give you another job. So that's kind of how it went with Dennis. I was invited over to meet him and uh, he had a couple of his usual stunt guys over and we did some fight scenes and um, then he hired me to come on and I forget who I was just, I think I was just what they call ND stunt, which means nondescript. And that means, you know, you're just in a crowd scene or it doesn't matter who you are because you're going to get hit by a car. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl or tall or thin, or whatever. Right. So it's a nondescript stunt job. And I was uh, a security officer on the bridge who um, then gets shot and dies like right away. <laughs> so, you know, it was very, very simple. And it was me and um, the Wharf double and the Jonathan Frakes double. Uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. We were on 10 forward and we get hit with, a, or I got hit with a phaser blast. And then I had to lay there dead for like the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> That's a neat thing. Just take a nap for the rest of the week, right? Yeah, sure. it was so funny. It was really actually a super fun job in that I was, I'm a huge nerd. And so I got to hang out on the bridge of the Enterprise. I mean, hello. And then, and the whole cast is there because they're all being held hostage or something. And um, it's so Brett Spiner would be doing jokes and doing, uh, he, he's amazing at impersonations. He would do impersonations and I'd be laid there supposed to be dead and you could see my body shaking because I'm laughing. There, there just, that was really super fun. Um, and, you know, Madelone liked me. I like to say that I, I teach, now a, a lot of personal growth personal development stuff and i say how important attitude is and i think that's one of the things den liked about me is that i uh i have a really good attitude when i work not always in my about myself or in my life i had to learn it the hard way but it, it at work i had a really good i'm very cooperative i enjoy what i do if i don't i shut up about it it's you know it's not nobody else's problem if I'm not having a good time. You know what I mean? It's, that's, so I, I think that's part of um, what clicked for us and the guys. I had a really good attitude. Yeah, I would do anything that I knew I was capable of doing. And I was really clear about what I was not capable of doing. But for Star Trek, there really wasn't anything I wasn't able to do because it wasn't like I needed to get on a motorcycle, for example, yeah. you know. So yeah. uh, it was like one of the worst things you had to do was get, do a full burn. Uh, that seemed like probably the heavy, most heavy duty kind of stunt you guys would have to do there. And it was a very rare oh, thing to have a full I disagree. Burn anyway, I disagree. I think full burns, uh, you're so well protected. It's, it takes it takes nerves of steel, but I don't think it's the hardest stunt. 
at all. Not not by far. Well, what would you say would be the, the hardest thing you've saw on Star Trek specifically? Oh, on Star Trek. Oh, do you mean on Star Trek he did a full burn and that was yep. the hardest thing? Okay, yeah. I, I, I could see that then. I'll take that back. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I totally take it back. That's probably. But a high fall. High falls uh, are extremely dangerous as well and it can be very tricky um i didn't have to do a high fall but i did do i was doubling the non deep space nine and i had to just uh, uh slip and almost fall off a cliff and grab onto the cliff and then i'm pulled i am helped back up i'm not supposed to fall it was really interesting because they we did a we put a wire on me a harness and a wire so that i really wouldn't fall it's actually incredibly difficult to hold yourself up if you do slip and fall off the edge of a cliff you most likely 99.9% .9 of the time will fall off that cliff and die <laughs> so we wired me on and i was only about um 15 feet off of the sound stage now, one of the things I love about Dennis Madalone is that he's so safety conscious and he has a really great team of guys that, that work with him. Guys, I mean, guys and gals. So they were thinking ahead. Now, in case Pat should fall, in case something should go wrong, even though she's wired, I want safety down here on the floor. So uh, uh, Broadway Joe Murphy is kind of an expert in this area. So they put up, they put up these uh, boxes and boxes it loosely put together so that they will collapse when you hit them. You normally use boxes on, on small high falls like this one. And then you cover them with what we call ferny pads, which are basically moving furniture pads, you know, those kind of blue blankets that are quilted and they to soften any edges so you don't get hurt by the edge of a box. Um, and that was just there for safety. And Broadway Joe stood at the bottom because the one of the very dangerous things about short high falls is you do not you don't have time to correct your body in the air so you could land very badly like on your neck or straight on your feet which will could shatter your spine and shatter all the discs in your spine um so he was there to knock my feet out from under me to keep me flat so that i would hit the the box is flat. Uh, we rehearsed it a few times and all went well. Um, but of course, you know, on uh, when we went, the, the cable did break and I did fall. And he was right on it, knocked my feet out, landed flat, all was fine. But the reason I'm telling this story is because the next week I had a job. I was doubling Tracy Lords of all people. Um, on one of her, I think it was Codename Alexis, and where she's playing a spy. And uh, we were at the top of Palace Verdes. There's this big tower. It's like 320 feet in the air. And I'm doing a, a fight scene at the top of the tower. And again, they're going to try to kick me over the edge. And I was almost supposed to fall kind of thing. So we were going to wire it. And the, the stunt coordinator on that was a little bit of a cowboy. And he's like, ah, you know, do you need a wire? And I'm like, I want two. I want two wires because the one I just did broke, you know, I'm not going to survive a break on this one, you know, 320 feet in the air. So we did put two wires on it and one of them did break. <laughs> Honest it's, to God. I you think about it now, but it's horrible back then. I know it was horrible. And on the way we took taking the, taking the elevator down, back down to the ground, I had to sit on the floor of the elevator. My legs wouldn't, I couldn't stand up. I was so shaken by that. But if it hadn't been for that stunt job with Den, I wouldn't have thought of that. You probably wouldn't be here talking to us today. I mean, it right? sounds pretty terrible. What, what a dumb happen? way to die. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you did a lot of prosthetics also on Star Trek. You played a lot of different types of aliens. Uh, so I'd like to ask, which one was the worst for you to get made up in? Which, which had the worst prosthetics? That's a good question. Can I tell you the most humiliating? Of course, we love that. I mean, I had I, I, I was in full Klingon and that took a long time. And then there was a, a Deep Space Nine episode called Melora. And she had a, a lot. Uh, it took a lot of time because we had this extensive wig and forehead piece as well as the pale makeup. But um, the most humiliating, I got to be an actual character and everyone was, uh, you know, the crew was cheering for me because I got to be a character for this whole episode. I don't die till the end. So I was actually acting most of my scenes with Patrick Stewart. Right, we're so, talking about uh, Starship Mind, in fact. You, that's right. That's correct. 
And my character's name was Kiros. Michael Westmore, who's in charge of makeup uh, on Star Trek, is so excited. He said, oh, my God, I'm going to make you a brand new alien we've never seen. It's going to be amazing. I can't wait. And the, and the hair ladies, oh, Pat, I'm going to do something so awesome with your hair. It's going to be so great. We're so proud of you. So I couldn't wait. And my first day, I show up. And Michael basically puts a vagina on my face. It looks like there's a lady's clitoris right on my forehead. And then and the hair lady, Joy, teased my hair up to look like Bozo the Clown. I had to go like that through a week with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I was so embarrassed. He, and he's like, he look, takes one look at me. And Patrick goes, oh, Patricia. <laughs> Just like with deep sympathy. Oh, Patricia. It was so awful. I mean, to be fair, there are a lot of Star Trek aliens that look like various phalluses or, or lady mm -hmm. parts. So, I mean, you're, you're part mean, of the club now. I guess so. You know, I bore it like a champ. I said nothing. <laughs> I did my best, you know, but it was a massive disappointment, I must say. Although walking behind Patrick Stewart for that whole episode was a joy because he's wearing riding tights. He was supposedly going horseback riding on his break, you know, and so he's wearing these tights. And he has an awesome bum. And That's I got to follow news. him around for an entire week. So it made up for it. <laughs> and I was going to ask you about what it was like to be performing with Patrick Stewart. But I guess really the more important question is, how is his butt? So now we've got an answer to that. <laughs> we've got an answer. It, of course, it's, it, it, you know, it's amazing. And he's, he's a delight. He's a joy to hang out with. He's a really super nice man. So I'm sure you can all imagine that. He's exactly what you'd hope he'd be, you know. And it's kind of a fun episode because this was basically Die Hard in Space, this episode. So there is a lot of action. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And I, I do die at the end. My <laughs> as per my normal. Whenever you see me on Star Trek, you know something bad is going to happen. That's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Most of the time you don't see me though. Most of the time I'm somebody else. Now, with a lot of the different characters, a lot of these different aliens in particular, uh, there might not necessarily be space for padding. So how often are you doing Trek specifically where you're actually allowed to pad yourself up and be protected versus just kind of going in there with whatever your outfit is and taking the bumps? That's another very good question. I, I, we actually had special pads that were super thin that we could put on our elbows and our knees. And that's about all you could put on. You know, those uniforms don't allow for uh, bumps or lines. So, I mean, there's not even supposed to be nipples or bras in space. You know, you can't even have a zipper in space. So nothing was, nothing shows, you know? So it was tricky. Um, we had very thin, but sturdy knee pads that were, had a, an elastic backing and the elbow pads, the same thing. Um, I had a pair of elbows I really liked that were had a hard shell and they were basically just slightly batted under the shell, but the shell itself would keep my skin from being abraded. I would still get bruised, but I wouldn't at least, you know, not get a, a, a burn from it. Some kind of a, you know, a rub burn. Um, yeah. I, I actually think that a lot of the aches and pains I have today come from most of my Star Trek work because we did so many falls, tumbles, and rolls over and over and over and over and over again. And it, that kind of impact does take a toll on your body. Uh, folks like to hear this kind of stuff. You know, we know that you mm. have a rapport with your stunt performers, with your fellow stunties. Uh, but mm. what about the main cast, folks you are doubling for? Because you doubled for a lot of the principal cast on different shows you were in. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, you, do the stunt performers kind of stay in their own corner on one side of the room? Or do you get to really intermingle and form relationships with the principal cast members? Oh, that's another good question. We, It depends on the situation. Um, Sometimes the, the cast gets to take a break, a well-deserved break. So uh, the times that they are on the set, it would require when they blend in and out of the scene. So leading up to and then after the stunt, if there's an after in the scene or less, if they cut the scene and you come back later, they leave. Once they've done their ramp up to it, they're gone. Um, I, I was lucky enough because I'm there all the time that you know, I did have my own friendships, uh, but out of respect, we tend to uh, stand back and stay away from the cast so that they can focus on their lines and what they're doing. And um, if there's, you know, if they come over and interact, great, but we don't initiate it. 
generally, unless I need to put a pad on one of my actresses or, you know, I need to show her what she's doing or I need to see what she's doing so I can do what she does and then do the stunt. That kind of time we do have together. I did that with Laura Dern on Jurassic Park. But um, my, one of my favorite interactions was when I was doubling Nana Visitor for a fight scene. And Tim Russ was the Klingon in that episode. I can't remember the name of it. They have a fight and then and he punches her in the face. So it, what, how, how that works is whenever the camera is like over the shoulder of the principal. So if it's over Nana's shoulder, you're seeing the back of her head, but you're focused on Tim, then that's me. And if it's the other way around, then that's Tim's stunt double and it's on Nana. And Nana is, a, she's a dancer. So she's really good with her body and she knows choreography. She looks amazing in a fight. Uh, it, it's not like she needed me to make her look good. That, that was not the case. Although I, Terry Farrell did need me to make her look good in a fight. That was not her gift. Great, that just gives me a job. But for, um, for Nana, I was just kind of feeling superfluous, like, oh my God, she doesn't need me here. You know, they paid for me and I, I don't need to be here. Uh, but we'd flip it around and she, she's so, she's so cognizant. They would say, hey, Nana, do you want to be the in for Tim? And she'd say, no, no, I, I need Pat to do it. And she'd go step off the set because she knew that I wouldn't make residuals unless my body is in the shot. If even my elbow is in the shot, I'll get residuals uh, that will require, that will qualify me for that episode. And that's very important for a performer. Um, it's not a lot of money, but it adds up over time, right? And it goes towards your pension and your health care. So um, Tim was also really good, really handy, very talented. And um, Nana had, had stepped off. And it, this was the moment where Tim was going to throw the punch. So I'm, I'm standing in place and we rehearse it. Tim's perfect. And as soon as they said action, he stepped into the punch, which means he closed our protective distance and he smacked me full on in the head. And uh, um, I hear the whole crew go, <gasps> you know, that intake of breath. And, and Dennis is like, Pat, are you okay? I said, don't cut, don't cut, keep going. Because I mean, I'm already punched. We might as well use it. You know, it looked real because it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then, then I turned around to tell Dennis I was all right, that the crew did another, <gasps> because I had this huge lump on my head. I, as you know, you know, anything on your skull and your head has blood vessels very close to the surface. They react instantly. You will bleed a lot from a head wound or you'll bruise very quickly from a head wound. And so I had this big egg on my head. But in a way, it was great because it totally justified my entire day on the set. You know what I mean? I saved Nana from that happening to her. Completely justified hiring a stunt double for that. Turns out they also had a TV guide shoot that day. Can you imagine if she had to go to that TV guide shoot with this huge egg on her head? Wouldn't have worked out so good. Tim was mortified. He was so cute. He was just devastated. I was like, hey, dude, I'm fine. It's totally fine. And, and actually he did me a favor. So it's all good. <laughs> I've seen him and teased him about this many times. So basically this episode has now become a lot of really funny stories that were actually horrible, like when they happened. So that's <laughs> it was not, this part of the episode. Yeah, that was not really that bad. I think everybody else was so worried for me, but I was like, oh no, it's, you know, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. glad you mentioned that Nana was one of the folks who's handy. That's a term we've heard used from a lot of other stunt performers is handy. Uh, and that Terry was not. So I mean, I'd love, if you don't mind, uh, who else did you double for or that you saw when you were there shooting? Uh, who else was handy and who else would just, you know, very happily step back, and let their doubles take over and, and take the beating? Oh, my gosh. Let's see. I think uh, Michael Dorn was really gracious about letting his stunt double do everything. He was just like, sure, let Rusty do it. You know, um, Rusty and I did uh, Star Trek Generations. Rusty was his regular stunt double. Um, and we called him Rusty because even though he's African-American, he had little red freckles. He had freckles. He was so cute. And his hair kind of had a red so we looked really good together <laughs> with our red hair, you know. Um, so Rusty was a fantastic double for Michael. And we did that scene where at the very beginning of Star Trek Generations, the movie, that uh, they fall into the water. Uh, I think first Worf goes in and then, and then Data pushes Gates in. I was doubling Gates. So, uh, yeah, we had, it, that was actually really cool to do because we were – wearing those amazing costumes. I love those costumes, the British Navy costumes. Oh my God, so gorgeous. And we got to be on the Lady Washington 
out just outside Marina del Rey in the ocean. It's on this beautiful square rigger ship. Oh, oh so that actually was outdoors. I was wondering if it was a soundstage or if it was actually on location. Oh, it was location. It was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that day, actually, because I was wondering, that, that, to me, that stunt just seems like really miserable because you're wearing this really big outfit, this mm -hmm. old style outfit, and you're going to have to jump probably, I would imagine, more than once into that water. Uh, was that like a good day for you or a rough day? It was a great day. I, I tell you, I, I love, I'm a, again, nerd, but I got to be on the Lady Washington and I got to, you know, I'm, I, I'm a scuba diver. I don't mind going in the water. It's, that's not a big deal at all. And I, it turns out I was also pregnant and my son was born, you know, <laughs> nine months later. Um, I was the only one who didn't get seasick. I wasn't seasick at all. I, I don't get seasick anyway, but I, I, you know, I, I like to joke that it was because I was pregnant and it was an easy stunt to do. I, I was you know, thinking about, do I need to not say something? If I had been waiting, I had been waiting for months for this job because I, I was on the whole film. I doubled one of the Klingon sisters. I was on the bridge of the enterprise and, uh, as a, as ND stunt again, now that we all know that term and I doubled gates. Uh, I doubled Gates in that scene. I doubled her in a scene that when the Enterprise is breaking up. And I was stunt coordinator for the day and when we crashed the Enterprise. So it was a fantastic job for me. And that, that day was not just a day. It was about a week we were out there on the Lady Washington. Um, I, yeah, the, we were wearing very slim but wet suits underneath our uniforms. Um, not just because the water is cold, but because it gave us some safety uh, in buoyancy. Like we couldn't wear a buoyancy compensator of any sort, but we could have that wetsuit on, which would keep us from drowning because we're wearing boots and, you know, ja wool jackets and breeches, you know, that's, that'll take you down. <laughs> so that, that part of the, the philosophy was that this uh, would, would keep us safe being wearing a wetsuit, but super uncomfortable. Anyway, I, I, I didn't mind. I'm used to wearing a wetsuit. Wearing a wetsuit out of the water is unpleasant, but um, it, it wasn't a huge stretch for me, if, I guess, if that makes sense. Yeah, I loved it. I, I loved being with the, with the cast. Um, where we, were, we, had a, we had a launch, you know, we had another boat. So the Lady Washington was the set and we had a place to hang on another boat that was not the set. And that's where we could change clothes for us stunt doubles who did get wet. Uh, we could change into a dry uniform and go do it again. So, you know, I got to be in a closer proximity to the cast than usual. <laughs> I have some nice pictures from those days. It was, yeah, it was really, really great. Gates was amazing. She was so excited for me the day I got to, to stunt coordinate the, a movie set. She was like, I'm so proud of you. It was so great to have a woman being a, the coordinator of the set. It was great. I mean, it's also one of the things you've heard from a lot of the people who've been on Star Trek and in particular women performers uh, who have said, you know, the difference between like having a female director versus a male director. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I don't know what it's been like for you as a stunt person, but I mean, I don't know if you got to work with like Kim Friedman or any other females that uh, or, or any of the other ladies that directed Star Trek episodes. But uh, if you did, I mean, what was it like for you? Did you feel there was a difference when the women were in charge? Uh, I so that here's a little difference between being an actor and being a stunt person. The actors interact directly with the director. Stunt people interact with the stunt coordinator. He's the go-between with the director. So I did not ha interact with any any director. Okay, so it's just Dennis Madelone or whoever else was going to be there that day. Tom Morgo or okay. Yeah, but it was a, for it was almost always Dan. I mean, Tommy and I worked together a lot. He was, he was, we were often fighting each other, or, you know, he, he was, uh, we were on the same, sometimes on the same side, but often pitted against each other. He's a fantastic stunt guy. And I loved working with him anytime I got a chance to hang out with him. Um, but normally if Tom was, was taking over, it was because Dennis had to go to a different set. So if I was on deep space time with Tom, you know, Dennis would have to run over and, and be on the next generation set until that that show ended in this one and then it was voyager starting up so we sometimes had that kind of flux but it was only across the street <laughs> in paramount so he would just run across the street tommy would take over talk about an easy commute mm -hmm, exactly exactly so you got to double a lot of folks in some very interesting episodes and a lot of the guest stars as well. And mm -hmm. uh, the one I'd like to ask you about is the episode called The Outcast. I don't know if you remember that one. I sure do. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you, you doubled that one from Linda Kulea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a very interesting episode. It's, I don't think it's necessarily the most action packed one, um, right. but I was curious to hear what you remember from working on that episode and if you watched it after and had any thoughts about the, the topics discussed in it. 
Oh, I, I don't know that I watched it afterwards and I, it'd be really hard for me to remember. I, re- I, I liked that day. Here's what I remember. Um, it, it, the action we did was very simple. And then Tom Morga, <laughs> I'm glad we brought him up earlier, who is a big, tall guy. We have a, we have a scuffle in the shuttle and then he picks me up and he turns around or something in, in the act, in our fights, uh, choreography. And, uh, uh, when we, when we shot it for real after rehearsing it, he spun hard enough that I whacked my head on the set. And because it's a, because it was the shuttle, it had this hollow boom that it, my head made on the set. And, uh, Again, everybody went, <gasps> did you knock her out? What just happened? And, and he put me down and I was, I was okay. You know, it was all right. But um, Matt alone was able to give me an extra hundred bucks for that because I got, got my head in. I said, well, we can do it again. <laughs> and when I was raising my son um, and he would fall down, I would say, that's another 50 bucks. And so he would never, never cry whenever he felt that he would just go another 50 bucks. You know, kind of I would do the same thing. I want some hazard pay for this show, but I can't. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. It all adds up. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I can't discuss um, the themes and the, the, all of that. And normally, you know, when you're shooting something, you are not a part of that. You're not a part of what's happening much. Tommy and I were mostly working on our choreography, figuring it out, um, grabbing a camera operator to make sure that it looked good on uh, from where the camera was going to be, that kind of thing. We're focused on that and staying out of the way. Then if you're not on the set, you stay out of the way. You know, they don't need any more bodies on the set. You get off the set, you go somewhere else. Uh, to stay prepared, stay ready to go. That, one of the hardest things I remember about being a stunt double on, on Star Trek was that we were always the last thing of the day, the last scene of the day, the last moment of the last scene of the day. They do the stunts last because they figure that's the least important thing to do. And which it meant was we were always under the gun. So we don't have as much time. They've lost time. We've got five minutes to shoot this 10 second this thing. You know, it's like, what are we going to do? We're all come in and the, the energy is really tense. Very, very tense. Uh, that, was, that was the toughest part to maintain our cool, you know, to come in and, and do it and do it methodically so that we get it done right the first time. You don't have to reset, you know, we're, we're there, we're good, but, um, I do remember a lot of directors being incredibly stressed uh, and kind of not managing that as well. But Dennis was so good at just, you know, oh, we got this. We're good. Just here we go. Now, this isn't a question <laughs> about danger. And I don't mean Dennis Matt alone, but uh, I'll talk about danger <laughs> levels here, let's say. But uh, let's talk about repetitiveness of doing a stunt and performing a stunt on a television show. And I feel like you gave me a perfect segue for it. So, you know, not talking about what's the hardest thing, but what was the most repetitive thing that you guys just got stuck doing on and on? You were just waiting for this day to end. Was there anything like that that ever happened? <laughs> oh, another good question. I was doubling a Michelle Forbes as Ensign yeah. Rowe. Yeah, yeah. We're, on, we're back to Next Generation here. And again, Tom, Tom Morga, he was doubling that. Oh, I can't remember the name of that lovely actor who was the Romulan. And... In the fight, there's a fight between Ensign Rowe and the Romulan dude. I had to, and I, and I remember him being Romulan specifically because I ended up being a Romulan later. Uh, but I had to keep elbowing for Ensign Rowe, her fighting style, what we decided, you know, with Michelle, what her fighting style would be. And a lot, it was very hand-to-hand, uh, almost martial arts. And uh, I had an elbow to his midsection. Uh, kind of into his ribs. And he wore a bandolero. The bandolero had um, n- nubs on it. You know, it was textured with this rib, this nubs, not, they were square, squares put close together. Well, by the end of that day, my whole arm was nothing but black and blue squares. Just, oh, it's like, do I have to do this again? Are you serious? <laughs> You're constantly... And I'm not sure why. I think it was just because um, it was an involved fight. They really wanted to get a lot of her face and his face, which required a lot of camera work, you know? And we, so I did it like a thousand times. I was so sore by the end of that. 
Man, you're still also performing as well on screen, meaning you're having lines of dialogue in other shows besides your stunt work in Star Trek when this is all happening. Yeah. So what do you do to maintain your body uh, and more so maintain your own mental health and physical oh. and health while you're doing this? Because it can take a toll on you, I imagine, very quickly. Oh, Matthew. So, yeah, I mean, to be super honest, and I'm not sure this is where you want to go, I ended up with having a nervous breakdown in about, in about 2011. I just crashed and burned big time. I didn't take care of my body as well as I should have. Uh, I didn't take care of my mental health there. That sort of wasn't discussed back then. You just, I worked so hard, so continuously. I was on Babylon five. The next day I'd be over at deep space nine. Then I'd be shooting a Coke commercial at night. And then I'd get up and go to Babylon five. I mean, I didn't never turn down any job because you never know when the next job is going to come. And it was kind of a superstition among us that you never turn down a job. And everybody understood it. We never talked to the producers about it, of course. Uh, but all the stunt coordinators knew that. I would tell one stunt coordinator, sure, I'll be there as close as I can. I'm rapping on a set at 5 a.m., but I'll be there. I'll be there at 6 a.m. best I can. And, you know, they're like, okay. And then, then I'd say, I, I, at lunch, I'm going to go take a nap in my car. Here's where my car is. So they could, because I was exhausted. And they'd be like, okay, everybody kind of worked with each other. We all had that same philosophy, never turned down a job. Acting's different. You know, most actors don't do that. But I come from a uh, theater world. And that's where I started when I, I've been, I was working in the theater since I was 15. So in New York, I, I, I was doing a lot of theater and that's when I started to meet stunt coordinators and um, the stunt world was very different than, than working waitering jobs or, you know, like working in the Macy's department, <laughs> little girls department at Macy's, which is what I was doing in New York or modeling part-time, anything I could do to make money. Um, yeah, I, I, I wrote a book called Pleasure of Thresholds, which is a callback to my first scene on Babylon 5 with uh, um, Andreas Katsoulis, who was also in Star Trek. And he plays your car on Babylon 5. And uh, he asked me what my pleasure thresholds was. And so there's this theme for Shakar and Lita that ends at the last episode of, um, of Babylon 5, five years later. And I, I, as I was putting together that book, I was looking back at all the things I was doing. I was pulling out my call sheets and creating a timeline because I couldn't remember anything. I had no brain space. And by the way, I had a baby in the middle of that by myself, single mom. <laughs> you know, it's just like, what was I doing? Yeah, I think it's something worth mentioning here, if you don't mind me interrupting for a second. Please. Uh, you know, I, I was at a Star Trek panel years ago where Terry Farrell was on, and uh, there, the question was kind of asked about, you know, like things that she had to sacrifice being a woman performing in Star Trek, especially. And I guess this just goes for performing in general. Yeah. But she said, like, one of her biggest regrets was that she didn't get to have time to have a baby. And, like, she got very emotional over it. So, I mean, oh, you'd be able to God. do that and still be working. I mean, that's got to put a lot of stress on you. Just not, not just oh, talking to your God. body, but your brain, too. I mean, that's got to be rough. Bless her heart. You know, I did. Uh, she, you know, what a remarkable woman she is and i i love seeing her posts now um i didn't plan on getting pregnant that just happened so and it was just one of those those points in my life where i i made the it was like i just i don't know why i but i'm glad of course it's like the best thing i ever did but to have a child but it was rough and i couldn't talk about it like i said finally star trek the next generation cast got a movie and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I'm not going to miss this. It was hard. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know how, how much further we need to go with this, but in, in recovering from that break, the mental break, uh, I realized I had a massive breakthrough, which is often what those things are, right? They're a call, they're a wake up, they're a, they're a, a, a cry for you to pay attention to what you're doing in your life and to really take stock that so that's what I've done is just really get honest about what I, in fact, right now I'm, I'm kind of coping with, I've, I was a professional athlete for my whole life, a stunt woman. I'm getting paid to do these remarkable things and I have to stay in a certain condition. I'm a, a, a second degree black belt and it requires so much time in the gym and the, the gym and the dojos, uh, 
but I can't sustain that even now if I want to, if I want to have the business that I'm creating. So it's, it's a struggle with my ego, really, that, you know, I, I, I have to let go of the fitness level that I had in order for me to um, create the business that I want. That doesn't mean I'm going to gain a thousand pounds. That just means that I'm not spending hours in the gym because after that I'm depleted and exhausted and I need to take a break and rest. When we're working, what some people will do is they don't necessarily work out on the day that they actually are working. You, you, yeah, you stay stretched and you stay ready. You work, but you can't do both. I, I was really hoping I could do both. I just can't. It's, it's a really interesting thing to constantly be kind of watching your life and assessing where you're at. What do I want? What do I want to achieve? What do I want to leave behind? What am I saying now? Who do I want to be for my people? It's, it's, it's really, it, it keeps me um, always growing. That's for sure. Always learning and always growing. I mean, what's, if you don't mind telling us, what sort of answer yeah. did you find if you're within yourself to, uh, I, I guess, get to who you are today, to, to find yourself today here in 2021? I, I knew that I needed to, um, I needed to be kinder to myself. I'm still learning about self-care and self-appreciation or self-love, whatever you want, self-compassion, whatever you want to call it. It's something that is absolutely necessary. And, and yet I had none of it. No, I had no self-compassion. I came from the background. You work through your pain. You do not give in to discomfort, much less pain. Just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. I was also struggling with the kind of people I was hanging around. I think that I talked about this when I was at Frightmare over the weekend. I was, I was saying, look at the, the people you spend the most time with. And that's even at work, you know, it's, it's, it's people you don't have a choice in who you're spending time with sometimes, you know, because of work or, or your family who, who lives in the same house you do, but you are the sum of the people you're spending the most time with really the five people you spend the most time with. And that's sobering. I'm looking at the people I'm working with, many of whom I respect, but I don't want to be like. Do you know what I mean? You can respect somebody, but not want to be like them. You can appreciate them, but not want to take on that kind of a life. And yet here I am hanging around with all of these people and working with all of these people with whom maybe I didn't have as much in common after work hours, or uh, I'm rooming with people out of necessity rather than um, wholehearted choice, may I say. So, uh, and then, then I got very lonely <laughs> after I started to, you know, uh, employ those, those being super and radically honest with myself and with other people around me with kindness and with love, but still really honest about, no, I don't want to be part of this anymore. And I'm not talking about my stunt industry by that. Then, um, that was apparent, uh, what I needed to do because I was the single mom of a very small child. So I had to narrow choices big time. I couldn't afford to be hurt and exhausted. Uh, but it did, it did require some big shifts and some, some um, painful, honest moments with me. And I hired a coach, you know, I hired several coaches. I'm still working with a coach. I think that's invaluable, at least for me. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to see what, it, what do I want? I, I love being an actor, but I got to say, it's one of the worst, th worst jobs in the world. It's wonderful it, it, when you do get to work, sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes you have to take jobs when your people are treating you badly and it's a stupid show. And you're like, what the fuck am I doing at this? <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> you know? But if you get on a dream show, like a ba Babylon 5, you know, I, it's wonderful. You get to work with wonderful people and it's a joy. But getting, you are turned down. Actors are turned down 90% of the time. I was probably turned down more. I mean, I probably only got 1% of the jobs that I auditioned for. You're constantly feeling like you're not good enough. It's, that is built into the culture. They don't want actors to feel good about themselves because then you might ask for more money or more this or more that. They don't want you to have any power. That, you know, I felt like on Babylon 5, any moment I could get sucked out of an airlock, you know, on the script. And, you know, there was no negotiating leg to stand on. You had to take what they gave you or walk away. 
you could do one or the other. And uh, so I thought if I put, if I put 50% of the energy I put into my acting career into any other career, I'd be a fucking millionaire now. Seriously. I have no agency in, over my career as an actor. None. I am the, no, there's no power. And women have even less power. And if you're of color, you have even less color. I mean, power. You're, it's just the, ugh, incredible. Woman over 40, forget it. So I had a choice, you know, do I want to keep pushing away? Because um, I'm going to take a hit. If I, if I step away from this, my ego takes a big hit. Like I'm a, I felt like a failure. Other people see me as a failure. But then I realized, what does that really mean? And who are these people who are considering me a failure? Do I really care what they think about me? What I think the, the best revenge is to live an incredible life, to have an amazing life, right? To be full of joy and so happy. That's the best revenge. So I, I just kept working with these ideas of what do I really want? Since like I, I, like I said, I've been a professional actor since I was 15 years old. So to let go of that in my 50s and to start moving, moving towards something, I had no idea. I had no idea what I wanted or how I wanted to feel, much less, you know, a new career, what would that be? So I worked with coaches for a long time, honing in and honing in and honing in and honing in. So it's kind of like a, a Venn diagram, you know, what are you, what are your skills? And then what do you love? That took me a long time because I was so unused to looking at what I wanted. I was always going to what I needed to do or what I thought I should do. It had nothing to do with what I wanted, you know? And at first, and honestly, this went for a couple of years. At first, all I wanted to do, I want to cry just saying this. All I wanted to do was sleep. All I wanted to do was not have any pressure on me for a change, you know? But I had to pay the bills, you know? So I had to really get honest about what do I want to do? And then, then what, is, oh, I guess there's four pieces to this. So what are you good at? What do you love? What are your resources? And then, uh, then who are your, who are you, who's your community? What do you have there? And you put all of that together, like your skills and resources, your community. For me, it's nerds. I'm a huge nerd, plus the horror and the sci-fi that I've been, I have a community. And for resources, you know, I'm, I'm, I have um, uh, this ability to, I love taking care of people. I'm really good at taking care of people. I love that, super fun. I love surprising people. Um, and then what I do, what, what do I love to do? I love to travel. I love to have adventures and travel. My favorite thing is to do go like to go where they shot Harry Potter, go where they shot the Lord of the Rings, right? Go go to where I can get in the water and see amazing animals. Go to where you know these kinds of things. I started to put together, and I could get I could feel in my body started to respond, and I had to learn to listen to my body all over again because I'd shut that off in order to go through stunts and deal with being in pain all the time started to listen to my body would tell me when I got excited about something. So I'd share that with my coach. Like when I heard that Harry Potter, they were going to do a play called the cursed child in London. And, and I, they played, they, I heard the advertisement online and, and they played the theme music. And I, I got so excited. I had tears in my eyes. I was like, Oh my God, a play. I love plays. London. I love London. Harry Potter, the best of the best, you know, like, Oh my God what if I planned a trip and I brought a bunch of other nerds with me? So that was a huge thing for me. I started to create these adventures. It's, it's some of the hardest work I've ever done is to put together a, a, a group, a trip, take care of the details. Take, oh my God, it is such hard work. But when you love it, you do it. And this is your new business also, which is Quest Retreats, right? That's right. Exactly right. And I, I led, I mean, London was a huge one because it was a foreign country, right? But I love London and I know London pretty well. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do. So 
that was one hurdle. And I had an amazing group of friends who, who showed up and went with me. These just folks from all over the world who showed up. I had people from Russia. I had people from, you know, the United States, of course. I had a, 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 somebody from the UK. I had somebody from New Zealand. You know, I, it was just remarkable. And then um, the New Zealand trip was also, that was even bigger because it was 16 days and we went from the top of the country in London we stayed in one hotel and we had a home base for the 10 days but in New Zealand we started from the um the top of the North Island went all the way to the bottom of the South Island we were traveling I, I that was oh my god it was epic but it was so hard so hard to put together and it turned out it to me it's just like I still get excited thinking about it can't wait to do it again it was so epic and we had so much fun a bunch of nerds traveling together <laughs> it was so awesome and i i met uh, i've been to new zealand now a few times and i've met some actors who were in the films and i brought them in and they'd have dinner with us or they went to hobbiton with us or you know i was trying to arrange these surprises for people it was so fun that's really and cool. now we're doing one in africa at the end of 2022 so i'm finalizing that i hope to have that up within like the next week but i don't know if it's going to happen my website's in delay. But anyway, that's what I'm doing. And it's super excited. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have links for both your book, Pleasure Thresholds, and Quest Retreats in the show notes. So everybody's interested, make sure you take a look there. Thank uh, you. So, you know, Patricia, as we're coming to an end with this interview here, I just wanted to ask, you know, we, we've talked about a lot of different stories you've had, some days that have been better than others, but I'd love to just know, <laughs> what was your, like, best day on set? What was the most favorite time you had on a Star Trek episode? Honestly, even though Tim punched me on, in the face, I had a great time that day. I got to work with Nana, which was always a pleasure. She's, she's remarkable. Uh, I, I did enjoy the day too, that we were, um, I was doing a fight scene for Terry. I was, uh, it, it was like a battle scene before Worf and, and, and um, Dax hook up completely. They're kind of in that, they're kind of in that courtship phase. Uh, there's a battle with Worf and Terry. There's some sort of Klingon thing that happens. And uh, that was super fun because we we not only designed the weaponry and had, over, but we got to then design the fighting style. So I really loved doing that. Um, and I would say the other highlight was, as we discussed on the Lady Washington, that was remarkable. That whole, working on that movie was remarkable. I didn't mention that. Um, the, the stunt coordinator for the films are different because it's a different production company actually that goes in and produces the films. And I was fortunate enough that the stunt coordinator for that happened to be a coordinator who hired me a lot. And he wanted me in because he knew I doubled gates and he knew I, that I knew all the people, you know? And, and so when it came time for him to go shoot with uh, Mr. Shatner and Mr. Stewart in Vegas, their culminating scene, I took over, he put me in charge of the, uh, the crashing of the enterprise because he knew I knew everybody, which was very helpful. Um, that was amazing. That was amazing. And I got to double the tour and Malcolm McDowell punched me in the face. I mean, how good does it get? <laughs> so Patricia, now, you know, we started the show with a question I asked all my guests. I want to end it the same way. What's your favorite part about being a part of the Star Trek universe? It's, that's such an enormous thing. I mean, to, to be a part of history I, that to be a part of Star Trek, uh, it's, it, I can't, I don't even have the words. Matthew, I'm sure you can imagine, you know, like being part of all these shows, knowing these people, um, and it's such a positive thing. There's so many sci-fi shows out there that have this dystopian view of the future. That I, for me, we don't need that. Life's hard enough, but what I love about Star Trek is, is that it always has this sort of positive view. It has a positive view for women, for, for all different types of people, all different versions of personalities, um, conflict resolution. That I just think, I think Star Trek's the best of the best. And I'm really deeply proud to be a part of it, the community. Well, Patricia, I am very proud that I got to spend this time with you. Uh, you know, when we first started this interview, you were like, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna even have much time for a full hour. And here we are doing two hours. So. You know, I could easily go for much more. Hopefully you could do another day. But, uh, you know, I just want to thank you again for giving me all your time, telling me all of your amazing stories, uh, and especially just for being so open and honest about what you've gone through, what your process has been uh, after mm. all your time and been performing. So, 
you know, you never know who's listening to these kinds of shows. And I hope that if anybody out there is feeling similar thoughts, that they're going to hear what you said and, and take it within them. So thank you for, for giving uh, us that. Thank you for giving me the chance. I appreciate it, Matthew. And once again, folks, we're going to have links to Pleasure Thresholds. We're going to have links to Quest Retreats. And we didn't even mention all the charity work you did with like Penny Lane. So we're going to have links to that as well in the show notes to make sure that folks <laughs> can take action whatever way they want to and get involved. So thank you. Yeah, Patricia, thank you so much. It's been really wonderful. Uh, you know, you are a true trailblazer in stunt, in stunt industry. You broke the mold of performers who have gone, you know, not just sticking in stunts, but you've done everything. And, uh, you know, <laughs> not many people can say they've done what you've done. So, again, thank you so much for everything you put out there in Hollywood and on stage, what you're doing today as well. I really appreciate it. Thanks. And that was our chat with Patricia Tallman. And don't forget to check out her book, Pleasure to Thresholds, which is available on her website, Quest Retreats. We'll have a link for that in the show notes, as we usually do for all these types of things, as well as info on all the charitable organizations that Patricia works with as well. We talked a lot about Starship Mine on this episode, which was written by Morgan Gendel, the same writer known for the classic TNG episode, The Inner Light. We chatted about that episode in depth during our Richard Reilly episode, which I recommend you check out if you've missed that one. Richard's been in a bunch of different Star Trek, as well as way, way more stuff that you would not believe, so definitely do listen to that show if you haven't heard it yet. Morgan liked naming his Star Trek episodes after Beatles songs, which is how The Inner Light came to be since it was the B-side to Lady Madonna. The writer intended for this particular episode to originally be titled Revolution, but the producers quickly vetoed that idea because it sounded way too similar to the title of their third season debut, Evolution. As for Patricia's journey through Hollywood, it's certainly been a long and winding road, but there's something about the way she moves that's continued to keep her in the spotlight and in the news today and have such a prosperous career in sci-fi and across the universe. See what I did there, Beatles fans? And even though this interview was a very, very long one, there's still so many more stories Patricia hasn't gotten to. So if you want her to come back and do a sequel episode with me here, hit her up and hit up Patricia on her social media as well and let her know that you want her to come back to Trek Untold for another visit. That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, which is just one word in all those platforms. If you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, or any of those other locations, please leave a positive review and a five-star rating if you can to help show other listeners how much you like this podcast and spread the word. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday. If you're enjoying Trek Untold and in a position to financially support the show, I hope you consider being one of our Patreon supporters by visiting patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can help us out for as low as $2 a month and get some pretty sweet perks. Shout out once again to Triple Fiction Productions, who you can check out at triple-fictionproductions.net. If you're a collector of Star Trek toys in any size or scale or enjoy prop replicas, you're going to love the quality of their 3D printed products, and I'm sure you will be a repeat customer. If you have any comments, feedback, or suggestions for future guests, send an email to me at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope you'll beam up again with us next week for another episode of Trek Untold. So until then, I'm Matthew. Thanks for listening. And remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.